Hi, this is Mohamed al Kurd. Today I spoke with Dr. Randa Abdel Fattah, who is an academic, novelist, and the author of many, many books that have been translated into many languages. She recently published uh, an essay with Mondo Weiss called On Zionist Feelings. We spoke about my favorite topic in the world, which is Zionist feelings, and how uh, discussions of sentiments and uh, semantics are often elevated over the systemic, institutional, and material reality of violence and colonialism that Palestinians are subjected to. Please take a listen. Hi, Randa. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I appreciate your time. I've read um, your essay, in Mond your recent essay in Mondo Weiss about not wanting to assuage, not wanting to coddle Zionist feelings. And I, I really resonated with this essay because in the past few weeks, really in, in the past few months, it's felt like we are living in some kind of fever dream one where you see people getting bombed, you see people take their last breaths on the middle of the street, you see fathers and mothers collect the, the remains of their children. And on the other side of the world, the conversations are largely about somebody else's feelings, somebody who is usually in a high rise apartment, who enjoys rights and privileges that the Palestinian people have never enjoyed. Um, can you speak to me a little bit about your experiences with these things, uh, particularly in Australia? Yeah, I, I wasn't really um, incited to write that article from the frustration that I was feeling at really from one particular thing that had happened, which was the lighting of like iconic buildings around the world, but here in so-called Australia, um, with the Israeli flag in solidarity with Israel. Um, and then the natural response of Palestinians after that happened was to hold protests um, to mark the the escape from the the hostage situation in Gaza, the breaking free, um, and to to express that this was a moment in which Palestinians were going to assert their right to self-determination and to liberation and to then be met with governments lighting buildings with the Israeli flag at the same time that they were expressing these, you know, outpourings of emotion and grief and the, the emotional language that was used was really striking to me. The, the almost, you know, the, the weaponization of grief and tears and outrage and shock and horror with the colonizer and the oppressor. And we can unpack why that seemed to be so much more heightened now because there had been resistance. But for me, what was so shocking about this as well was that our grief as Palestinians was never ever acknowledged or validated. And not only that, when we dared to protest about the fact that we have never had anything lit up in our names, we were the ones who were offending Jewish Zionists' feelings. We were imposing and encroaching on their spaces of mourning. We were daring to grieve when they should have had the space to grieve. And it was just this, this inversion of victim and victimized that just drove me crazy. And then I started to notice, or we started to notice as advocates, that every time Palestinian protests and marches have been reported on in the media, it has always been juxtaposed with a rise in anti-Semitism or that it's always been juxtaposed with how the Jewish community is feeling about these protests. And then there will always be some soft story about a Jewish person in a, a community who feels that it's becoming a much more unsafe place to live and to grow and, you know, it, they're feeling under siege and isolated. And this blurring, it's almost this, this attempt to equate the feelings of the colonizer and the colonized. And all of this was, you know, compounded by more and more stories coming out of, you know, the community, the Jewish community um, expressing, you know, shock and horror that they've never felt so unsafe, they've never felt so isolated or marginalized, um, and the security risk. And even in even reports that the only place that they feel free would be to go back to Israel to go and live in Israel and no sense of irony in the reporting on this and just the complete erasure of Palestinians feelings grief um you know what we are going through and that's why I wanted to unpack this because 
we know that there is a lot of reticence to even attempt to challenge the idea that we should hold space for Jewish Zionist feelings. I do not believe that I should. I believe, in fact, that it is my duty to make them uncomfortable. I am quite happy for them to feel, you know, that they are not in a space where they can safely articulate that they believe that my people should be under a genocide, should be killed. Surely that that should not be a controversial proposition, and yet it is. It's it's interesting because this is come this is this precisely the idea that we should hold space for Zionist feelings comes comes from this concept that Zionism could mean different things to different people. This is always brought up, it's particularly by by Zionist or liberal Zionists. It's always brought up that, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is like a to some it's this this is settler colonial movement. It's it's uh, racial elimination, it's expansion, it's occupation. But to us, it's self-determination. To us, it's like decolonization. To us, it could hold these different multitudes. And I find that infuriating. I find it insulting because Zionism has told us once once and time and time again what it is on the ground. We see it in the systemic polit- in the systemic policies. We see it. We see the way it's operating on the ground. But w- what you're talking about... Uh, to me, it strikes me as this kind of elevation of the sentimental, of the semantic, right? The feelings of the the the, the colonizers or those um, sympathizing with the colonizers over the systemic conditions under which we live as Palestinians. And that is the most bizarre, bizarre thing, but that seems to be the, the condition of the world. You know, there's a protest in Australia or there's a protest in London and the headline about this protest is about a certain chant that is screamed at the protest, not about what the protest is protesting in the first place, right? The, the bombs, the American-made, European-financed bombs dropping on the Gaza Strip. Um, when you say that you reject this, when you say that you reject this um, coddling, right, this, this uh, demand that you coddle these feelings, how does this look materially? How do we reject this, this imp- it, I mean, we, we have to keep pushing back. And I think there's, for me, I hold the most contempt for progressive liberal spaces. You know, I, can, I know what I'm dealing with, with the right, the far right. But I see these ones as sort of the Diet Coke of the far right. You know, like they, this, you know, like we can really <laughs> unpack like these grand abstractions that they make about say, free speech and, you know, um, you know, the marketplace of ideas and, you know, polite, respectful debate. We know that, I mean, you you know, you unpack it beautifully in all your essays and and in your interviews, but for me there has been like the cumulative effect of the progressive space offering these shields to Zionists for so many years in universities, in liberal media, has brought us to this point. It's brought us to a point where they have wrapped cotton wool over the Zionist, Jewish Zionist industry so so thick that it has made it very hard for us to penetrate through that. And your, your essay, you wrote this um, amazing, I, I remember reading it when I was at Palestine Rights in September in the airport, um, at the horrific LA airport <laughs> waiting in transit, and I read your essay um, looking at, you know, the, the idea that we are constantly held to this standard of understanding, you know, years and years of European anti-Semitism and the labels and the and the imagery, as if somehow we need to understand all of that history, in, and then become advocates. But I remember reading that and thinking, you know, the reason why we why we are here is because the the that liberal so-called space where there is this debate and ideas has never interrogated Zionism the way it does any other, you know, racist, supremacist political ideology. It's never afforded it that same treatment. And that's why there's this panic. There's this panic at at actually using, like, the normative tools that we do to unpack racist ideologies in the same way that we would for other ideologies when it comes to Zionism. And that's why you have this, you know, like you said, this bizarre situation and this ludicrous situation where we can actually allow Zionists to dictate to us what Zionism means. You know, whatever dictionary they want to use, whatever feelings they have about what it means to them. You know, I've met people who say, I'm a cultural Zionist. You know, um, at the end of the day, I don't care how you define 
it's it's like me honestly walking up to a white supremacist and saying so tell me what does white supremacy mean to you and I did that through for my um, PhD I actually looked at Islamophobia from the point of view of Islamophobes and interviewed them and sat down with them and tried to unpack what was the thinking there but I never actually you never did that with the intention of um, validating or normalizing their rhetoric and their claims it was to interrogate it and that that's what the left has never seriously done is just accepted at face value what Zionists claim and doesn't have the courage to say, well, actually, no. Um, you can't tell me that cultural Zionism is about equality for all when you have an apartheid system or that this is a, that this is about self-defence when you've killed 30,000 people in two months. You know, so there's, there's, no, there's no integrity or, or, or um, even tr- truth-telling here, in, in even the pursuit of wanting to... to, to to, to come to a situation where we can actually say there are some ideas and ideologies that don't have a right to to speak on behalf of themselves because we look at what they're doing in, in their name on the ground, like you said, the material reality. And it's precisely this. That I love the analogy to white supremacy because it's uh, it, 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 it feels like a no-brainer when you talk about white supremacy. I also recently uh, said something about it being similar, you know, like the whole conflation of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism and saying that if you are anti-Zionist, then you're anti-Semitic. Oftentimes we have the time to listen and to sit with these questions and we have the time to li- to defend ourselves and, and say, no, actually, this is not the case and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the times we give weight to these accusations. Meanwhile, if you accuse you know, uh, somebody who believes in anti-racism of being anti-white, that's, you get scoffed at. That's just not real. That's not a real thing. Or if you accuse a feminist of misandry, that is hilarious. It's not a real accusation. But what, what these accusations reveal and what this kind of inversion of reality reveals, as you said, um, is the primary goal of, of Zionism. And it's it's been so successful because it's been situated outside of history, so to speak. It's been so exceptionalized. We are able to look at everything with scrutiny except for Zionism. And you wrote, you wrote in your essay, um, you know, your aim is to expose what is unsaid in the public sphere. And what is unsaid is the following, that Jewish Zionists demand Palestinians and those who support Palestinian self-determination to be silenced, that we collectively tolerate Zionist Zionist racism as a gesture towards atonement for the violence of European anti-Semitism, that we allied 75 years of violent occupation to assuage settler death and suffering on October 7th. I found those lines particularly compelling because they they say the quiet part out loud. It's the idea that we are going to put aside all of our suffering and elevate Jewish suffering or Zionist, I would argue Jewish suffering because that's how they promote it. This is how it's uh, promoted on a national institutional level to elevate their suffering above our own as, as though we are still living in the time where you know in the time where the holocaust was happening we are we are past this time you know uh, the, the tables have turned the power dynamics have shifted uh, the israeli regime is one of the world's superpowers it is the only nuclear regime in the middle east and yet and yet despite this might despite this power despite this sophistication uh, this technological advancement despite being one of the richest countries one of the most supported uplifted amplified countries it it still gets to be also a victim on the world stage, and that is absurd. It's uh, it's so absurd, and it leads to the scenario where there's this hypersensitization to Jewish feelings because we don't want to offend them because they're still the victims of the Holocaust. Like it's this it's it's like the image is forever. You know the the well, not the image the status of um, Holocaust victim is just, um, you know, it, it will continue forever. And, yeah, like you said, it completely, completely denies what is happening on the ground and that the power dynamic has changed. And also that, and the power and the power that the power imbalance, you know, the reality of life for Palestinians. But also that hypersensitization, what makes it so obscene is it's happening at the same time as the desensitization to Palestinians being slaughtered every single day 
And we don't, I mean, just from the last, you know, since 8th of October, we have this heightened environment in which everybody is so quick to not offend the Jewish community who are feeling under siege because Israel is in the news again. People are protesting against Israel and we just feel so under attack. And all these politicians are out there reassuring the Jewish community that we are here for you, that we will fight anti-Semitism, that we will increase laws. We've had this conversation here in New South Wales in Australia. We will, you know, we will strengthen laws to protect you. And at the same time that this is happening, what makes it so obscene is this complete desensitization to the fact that every day Palestinians are losing their lives. And you can even break it down further, like look at, for example, university spaces. So university spaces are now, and, you know, you know, like, for example, you know, the Harvard um, president who was forced to resign, first black president, you have university spaces and we have a similar situation here where the, you know, the absolute censorship on Palestinian advocacy is, is happening um, at the same time. And we have these conversations about how Jewish students aren't feeling safe and we need to address anti-Semitism on campus. Meanwhile, the University of Gaza is bombed. Ju- Palestinian professors and students are being slaughtered. We could literally create genres of, of obituaries, you know, journalists we could create. And the media, again, we have to protect Jewish feelings. Meanwhile, you have destroyed the media industry in Palestine. So it's, again, it's this constant juxtaposition of these obscenities. And again, like, you know, like I was saying before, it's because I believe very strongly that the progressive left need to be held to task for being the shield that has allowed this to to really fester and fester so that now we are at a situation where there's literally a genocide happening and we cannot even say, we cannot even protest against it without, like you said, our political demands being reduced to emotions, our political demands being reduced to we hate Jews. Uh, One of my favourite things that you've written about is, again, that essay where you unpack this, this, idea that we cannot even talk about what Jewish, you know, Jewish versus Zionism. We have to constantly make these disclaimers. And you said it, you know, yourself about how feminists are never demanded, have never, never have to make those disclaimers. As Palestinians, we always have to do that. And it gets tiring. Um, and it and it becomes almost sometimes it feels like we end up validating that dichotomy. Why should we do the hard work when we know that it serves the Zionist lobby for that entanglement to stay extremely tricky and um, and confused because it shields them because it scares people, and those who can make that distinguish distinction don't want to. One of one of the examples you gave was when the Star of David was literally burned into a Palestinian's face, and the Star of David is a really good example. Um, I, I remember in the in the first weeks here, we had um, Palestinian students were creating counter po- protests flyers with um, images of children, and they were kind of looking the same as the flyers that um, the Jewish Zionist students were planting all over universities. And they they had put the the Israeli flag at the top with some blood dropping. There was mass panic within the Palestinian advocacy community. We can't do this. We're going to be accused of (laughs) anti-Semitism. Have we really come to this? (laughs) Have we come to this situation where we are doing damage control preemptively, using their symbols. <laughs> it's, yeah, not it's, not, it's not on us. Alas, it's not on us. Yeah, it's, it's self-censorship. It's this, uh, the, it's it's absolutely self-censorship, right? It's like you are whipped into like perfecting every syllable that comes out of your mouth. You are, you know, you are trained to like perform for an audience. This is also the chasm between Arabic and English because in English, we are anticipating, we are waiting to see, um, we, we almost know how the audience is going to react. And so we, we, we don't talk about the material conditions. We don't talk about the occupation before we talk about um, denouncing all the things they want us to denounce be- before making sure we don't confirm any of their biases. And this is precisely the point of all of this is to be distracting is that we lose time instead of talking about the occupation, instead of talking about the siege, we lose time talking about hypotheticals and abstractions and and what's offensive and what's not offensive. Meanwhile, again, there is bombs dropping, but this is, again, precisely the point is to be distracting. And I think we don't. We don't need to be distracted by these things. We need we we don't need to give them weight um, because. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's lit- 
this is the thing that drives me the most insane is that you have a state that actively, willingly, explicitly desecrates Jewish symbols for its own enterprise. And then the weight of sanitizing that desecration falls on you as a subject, as a colonized subject, as an occupied person. It's not my fault they march around with, with uniforms that have the stars of David on them. It is not my fault that they plant this, the, the Star of David at the heart of the massacre. It is not my fault and it's not my responsibility. You said something at the very end of um, the essay. You said, enough, خلاص. and I think this يعني, is the heart of where I think we all need to head at as a Palestinian movement, as the left, as people who uh, believe in in human dignity, who believe in resistance and who believe in all of these so-called progressive things, we can no longer tolerate this. It is absolutely, completely ridiculous and bizarre that we are yet having these discursive discussions about what is and what isn't offensive um, linguistically, what is and what isn't offensive psychologically. Meanwhile, you have 6 million people who have absolutely no rights and that is treated as the status quo. But I believe this is rooted entirely in racism, right? You talk a lot about how our right to grief is robbed from us, let alone our, our right to rage and our right to resist and our right to um, you know, armed resistance or violent resistance and so on are robbed from us. Meanwhile, their violence is not only um, you know, celebrated and mourned and you know, uh, have their, the Eiffel Tower lit up in their colors, but it's institutionalized and it's perfectly legal. It is perfectly legal. And I think this comes, this comes down to race to the idea that we are not seen by these actors, by the world's superpowers um, as human beings. And, and thus we are not, um, we are not uh, offered or allowed uh, the right to mourn or the right to grieve. And our, our lives simply mean less than their lives do. And when you say khalas, you are saying that you refuse to exist in this world order anymore. You refuse to accept the status quo as the norm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I I take a lot of um, my sort of, I trained, like I cut my teeth on activism really with 9-11 because I'm from that generation. And in the beginning of 9-11, we were condemning, condemning. We were, we do not condemn terrorism. We do, you know, we were, that was our, reflex because we were so scared that this was about um we didn't we didn't understand the the we didn't have racial literacy we lacked the racial lit literacy to understand this in its broader context we actually thought this is because they don't understand muslims they misunderstand us if only if they read the quran if only we did more interfaith gatherings if only they understood who we were then they wouldn't hate us and call us terrorists and of course you know you learn very quickly it doesn't matter how much you condemn that is never going to be the point um, and it's the same here. It does not matter how it, it, there is a point at which you no longer frame and articulate your political agenda and demands and your um, your vision and aspirations through a white gaze, through the, the, the gaze of how is the other going to accept this? How can I, like you said, sanitize this in a way so that they will come on board? No, part of being part of a liberation movement is to now say we will determine the terms of reference on which we will we will assert our right to independence and self-determination and i think we're seeing that that it took it took 30,000 you know and going for the progressive except palestine the peps for a lot of them to wake up that's another that's another interview altogether another conversation altogether about the rage i feel about that because I feel that there are so many people who have come on board now who have, through their silence, been complicit in the conditions, the discursive conditions that we are up against, which have prevented us from being humanised, that have allowed this dehumanisation to occur. And I'll give you one example of this, which is very current, which is the mass rape claims. How quickly they spread, like it was like wildfire, because the racist discursive oh. conditions were there. They were primed to believe that the Arab, bestial, savage, predatory male 
despite the absolute ludicrous like fantasy of that just the New York Times article alone which was quickly debunked (laughs) you know and the people that I saw on my Instagram feed people who had been been posting about Palestine were suddenly withdrawing their support you know because how could they how could they not acknowledge you know these these mass rape claims and the reason that they lost their intellectual prowess for those moments is because they had been primed for so long to believe this of course the arab male is going to interrupt you know uh, this mass um you know operation to gang rape a, a, a woman you know and and to commit these absolutely disgusting obscene violent acts which were so clearly, so clearly to anybody who understands the way that rape is weaponized against brown and black communities in service of empire, quickly would would see through. And yet they were still pri- they were primed to uh, to do that because they didn't do the work all those years b- before to challenge this racism. And we, you know, we constantly saying this, reducing this to an issue against Jews serves the Zionist agenda, and it it it. it it robs us of the intellect and the political, um, you know, the the, the the politics of what we are fighting. This is not about emotion. It's not about um, uh, interpersonal hatred of Jews. Most Palestinians have spent less time thinking about Jewish people as a Jewish people than than the Zionists have about us as the enemy. Like if you look at TikTok just TikTok and the way the hatred for Palestinians. And then you look at Palestinian TikTok, you look at Palestinian advocates. What are we talking about constantly? Freedom, liberation, imagining a space for everybody. Our our aspirations and our language is so different. And yet we are constantly the ones that are put in the witness stand to to answer to what? To European anti-Semitism. Remember when you were invited to Adelaide um, Rights Festival? Yeah. The, yeah. How could you forget the the absolute <laughs> Muhammad al Kurd is coming, the biggest anti semite in the world is coming to Adelaide, as if anyone knows where Adelaide is, Aslan. And you know, the, <laughs> one line in your poem, and I still love how you didn't even know what blood libel was when you wrote that about the organ harvesting. Was it about that line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was that particular line. Which is, by the way, it's it's nuts because the line is real. Like what I wrote about is real. It's first of all, I'm, it's poetry and I'm allowed analogy and I'm allowed yeah. to be creative even if it's not real. But it is a real practice. And it's this this tells you like even if you as a Palestinian do all of your homework, even if you do all if you take all the right steps, because I remember when I was writing that somebody had told me, maybe one of my instructors had told me, do not put a footnote in the poem. And I mutilated the poem, I desecrated the poem and I put a footnote that linked to a news article to confirm this or creative line in a poem that Israelis did indeed um, harvest organs from Palestinians and other non-Israelis without their families' consent, without them knowing, and they are doing it today in the Gaza Strip. But these things that are absolutely outrageous, like uh, organ harvesting, which is documented and has been increasingly documented in the recent Israeli war on Gaza, like claims of rape, um, which have been documented and have are increasingly documented also, um, kind of sexual assault against Palestinians by the Israeli military. Um, even the claim that um, Hamas fighters had baked a baby in the oven that was immediately debunked by the Israeli military, which has actually occurred on the hands of the Zionist militias that later formed the Israeli military in the Nakba. All of these claims, they do not generate headlines. They do not generate headlines because we as Palestinians, as non-white uh, people, we we are just naturally the subject of violence, we are. This is we are disposed to be subjects of violence. This is our natural state to be raped and burnt and mutilated and desecrated and have our organs harvested. This is what happens to us. So the exception, the exceptionality uh, of violence only like violence only raises eyebrows when it when the subject of it is a white person or a settler. This is only when violence becomes deplorable. Um, but you said something earlier about this uh, racial literacy, and you said if you and you were kind of um, saying it in jest that you had thought or like the movement had thought back in the day that if white supremacists or racist Americans and so on 
uh, were to read the Quran or like the, were were to understand Muslims better, then they would have a different a different well, approach. The, the you know, and it reminded me. It reminded me of this anecdote. So Yosef Yosef uh, Whites Yosef Whites, who was the director of the land and afforestation department in the Jewish National Fund, who was known as the architect of transfer. He is he was you know responsible for the mass dispossession of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. He wrote in his diaries that he would visit Palestinian farmers, Palestinian peasants in their lands. And they would invite him into his home and he would eat from their food. And he wrote about how he was even disgusted that Palestinians were eating with their hands. So I assume they gave him mansaf, which is, you know, a very good meal. Um, and he still stole their lands. We, we welcomed him in. We gave him food, for God's sake. And he still, you know, stole our land. So this idea that if they understand us better, if we present ourselves as the most perfect, most parallelable victims, then all of this violence um, will cease to exist on our bodies is, I don't want to reduce it, I don't want to make it reductive, but I think it's like, there's here I see there's like a crisis of dignity. You know, we have been, we have been forced to abandon parts of our dignity, um, especially in the West, to say that, okay, I'm going to no longer be a human and most of all be a performer to assuage your feelings and your biases against me. So maybe then you can afford me humanity again. I I respect myself too much. I think Palestinians respect ourselves too much to do this. Yeah, absolutely. You know? that, the point about dignity is so key because for years we spent time like as in the islamophobia industry talking about the dehumanization of muslims in this in in a time where there was a complete vacuum for example of literature like i said this as a writer and so I, I i i wanted to write books in the beginning that humanized the muslim and i didn't realize at the time how how i was dehumanizing myself in that process by having to persuade somebody that i am a human is not my problem you know, and that's what I concluded even with my um, my like PhD research, looking at Islamophobia from the point of view of the perpetrators. It is not my job to fix Islamophobia by making Muslims more palatable, more um, you know, by by uh, uh, you know doing damage control, by um, doing a PR campaign, you know, for Islam and for Muslims. It is not my job. Uh, racism is a you problem. And you have to you have to solve it. You have to address what's wrong with you that you need an other, that you need someone to dominate. And it's the same, I think, now for Palestinians, if at this point, because there are unfortunately still those who a very small minority, but who still feel that there is a space for this, you know, dialogue and interfaith work and completely obviously mixing up um, issues there, but still feel that there is this space for balance and, and panels and I a lot of us are now moving to a position where unless it's, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary, why should I only be allowed to be interviewed in a media interview if there is a balancing Zionist on that panel and really weighing whether whether it's really worth it or whether withdrawal, if there is actually more power now in withdrawing my labour and my voice. If you want the if you want balance, I'm not going to give it to you because I do not need to be balanced. I will not be balanced. I would never expect a black person to to be balanced by a white supremacist calling for their death and genocide. And there was another point you made earlier, which I think is really important, which is um, the sort of the indig about the racial the, the about the indignation, the racism, the expectation that we are just that violence just happens to to Arabs and and Palestinians and. That's part of the desensitization. And it goes back to the issue of feelings and grief about this public distribution of grief. And it reminded me of somebody that I interviewed during my PhD who it was, if you remember in 2015, there was the um, ISIS suicide bombs in, in Beirut. And there was no nothing on Facebook, which was the in thing at the time, nothing on Facebook, um, you know, no messages of support, no safety check and no um, Lebanese flag filter. And then the next day there were the attacks in Paris and Facebook was completely lit up with the um, Paris um, flag, or oh, sorry, the French flag and a safety check. And I remember interviewing 
some people who were saying, oh, you know, I just can't believe that this would happen in Paris of all places. They had no idea about, about Lebanon. And I was trying to unpack, you know, what, what, what this grief was about. And, of course, there is the sense that, well, they look like us, so there's a natural sympathy. But it wasn't just that. It was like, and it was a slip of a tongue that one said, which is, well, you know, terrorism usually just happens there, but this was something that was quite a shock. And it's true. There, there is this sense that Palestinians are just killed or die, and that is the way that it is for them. There's no interrogation of why those conditions happen. And this expectation that we are constantly victims, but we're not even afforded the status of victims. It's just the natural way of things. And that's when all grief and sympathy is suspended and all, all sense that of, of, of our humanity is completely collapsed. And, and, and instead, our grief and mourning is completely um, deferred to the feelings of, of, our, of the perpetrators. And that's racism. It is absolutely nothing but racism. And but the demand that we accept the status quo in which we are just we just happen to be constantly suffering and never allowed to retaliate for that suffering. Dr. Randa Abdel Fattah, I want to thank you for your time with me and I want to end with your words. You say no amount of intimidation or emotional blackmail will cower Palestinians into silence, into shrinking our voices, adjusting our language, compromising our demands and claims or repressing our feelings. When the feelings and fragility of Zionists are used as a rhetorical shield to de deflect from engaging with the moral and material reality of genocide, Palestinians are left to ask how many of us must be killed, maimed and injured forced from our traditional land and beloved homes, be tortured and, and have our schools, universities and livelihood destroyed for those in power, those who have the power to stop this genocide, to say in public, never again. Enough. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.